Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. Compliments of the season. We haven't seen you since last year, December. So today, our topic of interest will look at the viruscape, reflections on law, cities, and COVID-19. Law draws lines, constructs, it defines insides and outsides. It assigns legal meaning to these lines and attaches legal consequences if these lines are crossed. Law has rules and rights and underpins spatial tactics such as confinement, exclusion, expulsion, and coerced mobility. Law carves life worlds into innumerable boxes and assembles and reassembles them in ways that structure experiences from the most mundane to the most extraordinary. As it does so, it channels power throughout relational worlds, human as well as other than human. And with this said, we have Dr. Libeko, who will be a facilitator for tonight, I, Dr. Kim Lamont, will be the co-facilitator, and our esteemed speaker, Dr. Eric Marconi, will actually take us through the presentation for today. Dr. Eric is a professional in the development planning as well as he is an academic. His research interests are in planning, decolonial urbanism, and the right to the city. He also lectures at UJ. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric, for your presence here tonight. I'd like to hand over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kim, um, for this opportunity. I just wish to thank um, your institution, the Simani Mobile Clinic, uh, for extending an invitation to me. Uh, it's never easy to say no to you, especially given the kind of work that you do uh, reaching out to communities and actually making our spaces uh, uh, better and more livable. So thank you so much for for inviting me through. Uh, my presentation today, or shall I call it a discussion, um, is basically a reflection on some of the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years. And uh, that um, intersect law, um, specifically planning law, as well as uh, cities. And uh, now I've just added a new caveat, which is um, the idea of the necro scab or the, the virus scab. So um, this is actually a preliminary kind of um, reflection on some of the, the concept that, concepts that I've been grappling with over the last couple of years. And um, I must say that some of the, the work that I'll present, uh, it formed part of my, my thesis, which focused on um, planning cities and the making of uh, South African uh, cities from the 19th century to the present. Um, for the sake of this uh, particular presentation, I just wish to focus on at least three issues. We all realize that the world is experiencing an unprecedented existential crisis, and um, it is our responsibility as academics to try and flesh out the, the kind of moment that we live in, the kind of time that we live in, and what it means for development, and what it means for our cities, and as well as people that reside in those particular cityscapes. So the first part of my presentation will try and um, answer the question that uh, Professor Achille Mbembe actually posed about three years ago, and that is phrased as, what moment is this? Or if you will, what time is this? So that particular um, question is a philosophical question because it forces us and compels us to think of and about ourselves within a given historical uh, uh, continent or era. And then the second uh, part that I'll talk to um, is the location of law um, defined as uh, rights and uh, responsibilities, if you will. Um, its place in everyday activities, particularly in this apocalyptic age that we find ourselves in. And finally, I'll try and tease out uh, some of the things or that we can do in order to 
to, 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 to imagine a more humane society, to imagine more humane cities and regions. Right? So in as much as my talk will be more urban biased, as it were, um, the, the, the points that I'm, I'm making also apply to the hinterland. It also apply to, 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 to spaces where people uh, reside um, and that. So as part of my introduction then, um, I'll start by looking at Ashley Mbemba's work where he poses the question, what time is this? In asking this question, he sought to locate the human condition within the particular or a particular historical epoch. Mbemba's question has never been as urgent as it is today. In responding to this strong question, and I'm taking this whole idea of strong questions versus weak answers from um, uh, D'Souza Santos. Um, in responding to this strong question, uh, then the others that we're living in a moment of global entanglement. So that's one point that I need to put forward. We're living in a moment of global entanglement. Um, this entanglement is characterized by varied uh, escalations. It is also characterized by valid uh, accelerations. Right? So as you can imagine, there's been this intensification of global capitalism and globalization over the last uh, couple of decades. And what has been underscoring, underpinning that intensification of globalization is accelerated mobility, mobility of goods, the movement of uh, people, and some people, I'll qualify that statement later, the movement of ideas and information. So that has been, um, primarily the, the, the driving force uh, behind uh, globalization and global capitalism. And cities have grown, some cities have grown exponentially as a result of that intensified movement of goods, services, through information um, uh, revolution and the fourth industrial revolution that we're experiencing. But what we have seen uh, since last year, however, has been the acceleration of, of the movement of viruses. So COVID-19 as a virus accelerated and intensified throughout the world. And it moved from Wuhan to the rest of the world. And now it's a, it's a global uh, crisis that we're all trying to grapple with. So just imagine the figure of a globe trotter always on the move from London to Wuhan, from Wuhan to Cape Town, from Cape Town to Pulukwan, and so on and so on. This globetrotter has defined this moment of global entanglement. It is unfortunate, however, that now, as a result of that intensification of, 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 of movement and, and, and mobility, or hypermobility, if you will, we are experiencing this escalating movement of uh, a very contagious virus which is COVID-19. So that's one side of, um, of, of global capitalism and its, its intensification. But we do know that uh, given the, the skewed uh, power relations in the world, there are some people that find themselves uh, being more hyper, uh, mobile than others. Right? So the idea, the, the, the figure of the globe trotter is one side of, of the thing, it is the one side of modernity, if you will. But then there's the darker side of modernity, which in essence is coloniality that I'll talk to at a later stage. In that darker side of mo modernity, we see the figure of a poor person, the figure of a migrant who cannot move, the figure of someone who's been rendered illegal by law that he or she did not take part in the tree formulated, the figure of the, of the unemployed moving from one city to the next in search of work, and so on, and so on. So both the, the, the globetrotter and the migrant and the refugee, they constitute this global entanglement that we're talking about, uh, or, or that are, um, then they actually highlighted uh, when he posed that particular question, what time is this, or what moment is this? So that's, that's one thing that I needed to talk about. So now, as the, as, the, as, as the figure of the, the globetrotter and 
the, 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 the migrant uh, traverse through the city or the hinterland, the, the, the migrant, the refugee, the unwanted, the undocumented are referred to as the toxic other. So for centuries, I mean, we've seen, um, given our history, we've seen what global capitalism has done, especially its racialized nature in the global south. And we've realized that the so-called people of Ghana within the global south itself and within the global north have experienced some um, racial punishment, um, to use Ananya, Ananya Roy's uh, concept. They've experienced um, being labeled as toxic, Slavo uh, talks about the toxic other. And this label has been uh, sort of tagged, as it were, to those that reside on the dark side of modernity, to those that reside in the zones of non-being, what, what Fanon refers to as the zones of non and being or the zones of, of authority, right? So, 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 so now this is the time that we live in. This is the moment that we live in. Uh, this is the moment of the virus. This is the moment of global entanglement. But now we're experiencing the, the underside of it because the accelerated world, the accelerated movement of the virus has actually brought us to this point where the entire world is locked down in search of a vaccine, in search of a solution, and, 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 and that. But what I need to, to highlight before leaving this point is that the majority of the world's population has not been the subject of human rights. Because now when you talk about the virus, we're talking about uh, also the, the saving of people's lives. And uh, we, we're talking about saving the human which is, which is something that I'll talk about, which is the Anthropocene at a later stage. But what you've realized, and I'm reading this with uh, Boaventura de Souza Santos uh, in his paper entitled Human Rights, a Fragile Hegemony. He outlines that for, 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 for centuries, the majority of the world's population is not the subject of human rights. They are rather the object of human rights discourse. Right? So now here you are, faced with the world where the haves and the have not are pitted against each other. And especially so, you've got these uh, disparate spaces that they inhabit within given cities and so on. But what the virus is, is doing basically is to try and um, expand this whole pool of the, those that can be deemed to be toxic. So whoever is inhabiting a body now can be deemed to be the toxic other. But then it's something that we can talk about as I, as I move on to, 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 my, to, to my second point. Um, the second point basically attempts to, to build on what uh, Andreas Philopopoulos, um, Mihalopoulos, he's actually a law philosopher, and he created, he, he coined this, um, concept entitled Lawscape. Um, I used most of this work uh, while, 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 while studying and it helped me frame my thinking, especially when, since I was trying to have a, a philosophical concept that was going to allow, allow me to marry law and planning. And the idea of the Lawscape actually gave me that foothold. It gave me that way through. And according to, to to, to, to Andreas, the law and the city are intrinsically intertwined because everything that we do in the city is governed in one form or the other by law. From the houses that we in, 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 in inhabit to the water that we drink, to the color of um, painting that we use, to the cars we drive, how we drive those cars, to the food that we eat, etc., etc., etc. There is a specific law, there is a specific regulation that sort of guides that and regulates that. So as the law and the city um, encounter each other, the, the, their relationship becomes mutually um, reciprocal. So the city also informs laws, it also informs regulations uh, to a point that the, the law and the city become one, as it were.
So basically that is the, the, the sort of um, um, a synoptic definition of, of, of the loss gap according to Andreas. And um, I will talk to loss, loss gap, but also complicated with um, a concept that I'm trying to, to introduce, a, a concept that I've been grappling with over the last, well, the last year or so, and that is the concept of the microscape, or if you like, the viral scape, right? So that's my second point that I'll, I'll, I'll move to. But before I do that, I just wish to highlight again that in this era of um, entangled uh, existence, we have experienced an acceleration of suspicion and fear, right? Thanks to the virus again, right? As, 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 as Andreas once wrote in one of his pieces on COVID-19, he aptly states that COVID-19 is a disease of stoppage, of social distancing, of self-isolation, of no handshakes, no hugs, no flights, no passing through. So the fact that people now have to, have to self-isolate, of which some scholars refer to that as a euph euphemism for self-confinement, right? People now have to self-confine in order to save themselves from others who may or may not be toxic, but also saving their loved ones as well. Right? Mm -hmm. So now that becomes a paradox, isn't it? You, you, you separate in order to save, um, as it were. So that is why then um, Andreas refers to COVID-19 as a, an ethical disease because it demands ethics of self-positioning physically and at the same time ethically in relation to other bodies, of removing oneself or ourselves from the collectivity that we might harm despite our best intentions, of thinking beyond the edge of our skin. So what moment is this? This is the moment of self-positioning. Uh, it is a moment of isolation. It is a moment of staying at home, right? As opposed to a moment of go out there and conquer the world because there is something in the atmosphere that is actually um, threatening the Anthropocene and threatening human existence. So while COVID started in developed countries, uh, it was a developed country's disease, if you will, uh, with China and Italy locking themselves down first, it has unfortunately spread to communities and to countries with a relatively weaker uh, healthcare system. So since we're located here in Africa and here in South Africa in Johannesburg, we know that uh, we've got uh, special inequalities, historic special inequalities that uh, make it very difficult actually for the state to provide basic um, public health uh, uh, facilities and services to the majority of the people. So now with COVID now entering those particular spaces, it becomes almost impossible uh, for people living in informal settlements, for people living in favelas say in Brazil, if you will, to self-isolate and to actually be in their own spaces. But that cannot be said uh, for people that um, have the means and the way without to actually uh, cocoon themselves in, in, in private houses, in private estates, in gated communities, and so on and so on. So what COVID has done basically is to try, is to uh, make bare those special inequalities that we, 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 we find ourselves in. And they're not a South African phenomenon, you know, they're a global phenomenon, uh, because even in the US, in the UK, you do find people that do not have access to, uh, to primary health uh, and so on. So as the virus rages on in cities, the law in the city has proved to be mutually constitutive and even more so, uh, forming what um, uh, Andreas referred to as the law scale. So as I said, as I mentioned uh, 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 prior, the term landscape appreciates how all human and non-human activities are governed or regulated by law in the city. 
Even the simplest acts are controlled to a greater or lesser extent by the legal, some legal um, agreement, limitation or prescribed direction, whether this is public or private uh, spacing. So the advent of the virus then has therefore, I would like to argue, added another level of complexity uh, to the law scale. Now the fear of death has resulted, I mean, the fear of death resulting from contracting the virus has compelled governments to channel their budgets, programs, projects, and policies uh, towards managing uh, death, if you will, or managing COVID and what it can do to the human body and the human population. So it would seem, therefore, that the law scape has become a viral scape or a necroscape. And as I'm experimenting with these terms, i.e. You know, the necroscape and the, 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 the virus scape, uh, I, 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 I use uh, uh, Ashil Mbembe's concept of micro um, necropolitics, which in essence is linked to the, the Foucauldian idea or concept of biopolitics. So necropolitics is defined as the use of social and political power to detect how some people may live and how some must die. So I present in uh, uh, this evening that COVID law and the city have actually uh, come together in a symbiotic manner, creating a necroscape, a space where death has to be evaded, where death has to be budgeted for, where living um, is, 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 is a necessity because the, the human uh, species is experiencing uh, an imminent demise. So the necroscape, therefore, allows the state to legitimate its existence through um, hyper-regulation through hyper-policing as it visibilizes itself and basically detects our day-to-day -day, um, workings within, within uh, given spaces. So in this necroscope, the state commands hard and soft lockdowns. Right? Here in South Africa, we call for what's it being called, uh, termed family meetings, where the president actually articulates and outlines the plan of actions and he, he sort of relies on this in this command council to basically tell us what to do and so on and so on. It announces, the state announces curfews, right? It, um, it, it, it seemingly infringes upon our right of movement, the right to be, the right to entertainment, the right to eat and drink what we like. The state, again, we see it all over the world, basically, uh, detecting which businesses can be closed and which businesses can be, remain open or can operate, which schools or universities uh, should be open and, which, and when, and so on and so on. It regulates public gatherings, funerals, weddings. It digs graves in anticipation of the number of people that are going to, to die. Right. It mandates wearing masks and it fines and or imprisons those that violate its lockdown regulations. And more importantly, it is the state now that we look upon for that magical jab, the, the vaccine that is yet to come from elsewhere. Right. So, 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 so the, the, in this particular necroscope then, what we're seeing is the hyper -vis -vis uh, visibility and visualization of the law, right? Uh, we're seeing the state actually legitimating itself uh, in who goes where and why, legitimating itself in channeling uh, taxpayers' money towards this health crisis that we faced with. So now some people might, may actually talk of the return of the state. Um, if, 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 if you will. And so, paralyzed by fear of death through suffocation, with the threat and imminence of 
lungs collapsing, and other thousands of ways of dying. Most people around the world are inclined to tow the Provibia ban and to adhere to the state's regulations, almost without question. Yes, we've seen in some parts of the world where people actually violate uh, the, 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 the state's uh, call for people to wear masks. We've seen it in the US uh, with the ultra-right people actually uh, challenging the state, uh, claiming that they've got rights and so on and so on. But then in this time that we are, in this moment that we're in, um, hello? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. We can yes. still hear you. Okay, because I look, it looks like I'm frozen for some reason. No, no, we're listening. All right. So, so that is the law, that is the necroscape or the viral scape that we find ourselves in. So, now we can talk about the next crusade as reinforcing biopolitics. So the hastening and holding off of death itself seems to rest with the state's capacity to provide uh, health care at a universal scale. So as the four horsemen of apocalypse uh, gallop across the globe, fueling anxiety and grief, the state uses it's legal and planning instruments to regulate our day-to-day -day lives at a, micro, at a macro scale. And since uh, the necro uh, scale is linked to biopolitics, the state uses surveillance, cohesion, and control to save our, us from ourselves, as it were. So there also exists another layer of regulation at a human scale, right? So this is defined by some scholars as the uh, atom of politics, right? This is the, this is the self-regulation that takes the form of everyday care of the body through various means and activities. That would include um, taking multivitamins, physical exercises, self-isolation, medication, and so on and so on, or as well as meditation. As all this unfolds, um, as this biopolitics or the necropolitics unfolds, there's a realization that the Anthropocene, which centralized basically the human being as the center of the world, is in grave crisis. And humans are beginning to realize that they are but a part of the world and not the world itself. So in other words, there is no outside. There's one earth and this particular earth we share it with, as humans we share it with other non-humans and other, other species as well. And again, I'll turn to Andreas, who talks about this whole concept of the, the inside. And I, I read, there's no outside. In the box of the Anthropocene, where humans are both everywhere and decentralized, and in which all material bodies are clustered, breathing space is limited, future is closing in, human extinction is a possible reality. One stands on one's toes and looks for the outside. But there's no outside. Right. So that's the second point that I was trying, I wanted to make, which was the introduction of this whole concept of the necrospace as linked to the bio, to biopolitics and necropolitics. And then I'll move on to my last point, where I try to highlight some of the, the lines that have been visibilized at a global scale as a result of the advent of the virus. So with the Anthropocene in crisis, and some scholars believe that the virus scene has taken root, the lines that divide the world or cities or regions lie bare for us to see. So the, there are color lines, uh, nationalist lines, gender lines, edge lines, and class lines that shape our contemporary world, that shape our day-to-day -day, uh, spaces, regions, and cities. So these particular lines, particularly the racial line, has been used to, to hierarchize people um, with the, the so-called people of color or black people being deemed 
to be at the bottom of that particular racial hierarchization. Right? The, 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 the gender lines and the class lines have also shaped the, the geopolitics and the geoeconomics of the world for, for centuries, thanks to racial capitalism and its intensification across the globe. So what we're seeing now with the, with the lockdowns and with the world uh, at the brink of collapse, if you will, at least of, the, of, the, of mankind or human beings, what you're beginning to see um, are some states actually reverting back to the old politics of using the lines to define themselves against the, the other. And that other is deemed to be toxic um, in most instances. Right? So to give an example, we've seen states across the world, in both the global south and the global north, actually closing their borders, creating, erecting fences, as well as building walls to try and stop those people that are deemed to be undesirable from entering uh, specific spaces or specific countries, right? So now this is done um, um, in the name of controlling the virus. So one would almost assume that I mean, if, 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 if one is to follow that logic, then one would assume that this virus actually takes into account the, the, the borders and the parameters within cities and within countries, but clearly it does not. Right. But then what we're seeing then is the, is the growth of narrow nationalism as well as the acceleration of racism that defines that narrow nationalism. We see it in the global south. We see it... Um, in the, in, 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 in the global north, even in our own continent as well. So even though there's evidence that all human beings can be infected by COVID, the figure of the foreigner is yet again fingered as the most toxic other. We've seen uh, the scenes uh, on TV in Wuhan, for instance, at the height of the first wave, where some Africans in Wuhan and some parts of China were actually fingered as the most toxic other. Mm. Right. In the US, the figure of the so-called colored or people of color, the Mexican migrant, the black bodies and, 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 and such have been viewed with heightened suspicion, particularly by the racist ultra right. So I've talked about uh, uh, you know, the instances now in our, in our society, where in South Africa, all land borders are once again closed off to keep the influx of the toxic other from the rest of the continent. So, link that to the, to the, to, to the rise of the vaccine uh, nationalism, which attests to the persistence of what uh, De Souza Santos referred to as abysmal thinking, that is, the us on this side of the line versus them on the other side of the line. So as we're talking about the virulent space, as we're talking about um, the virus thing, as we're talking about the virus scape or the necroscape, we can also talk about the virulent politics that is emerging in some, part, in some parts of the world. And a very toxic kind of politics that emphasizes difference and downplays sameness. So while these draconian measures can be legally justified, they do not make sense. They are nonsensical in the sense that, as I outlined, the virus knows no borders. It knows no skin color. It knows no class, no gender. If anything, the whole world is not safe from the virus until all countries in the world have access to affordable vaccines. So to conclude, I wish to go back to the statement that Andreas made about, this, about our, our, our communities, about our earth, to say that there is no outside. We, we, we live in one world as humans as well as non-humans. And the world has been living in a permanent state of crisis for, for centuries. This is particularly so for people that 
have been on the receiving end of uh, racial capitalism and Eurocentric modernity, or people that have been living in a permanent state of uh, coloniality, if you will. Yeah. So this age of global entanglement then, with its viruses, with the, with the, with, with the climate um, uh, challenges, as well as the fires in Australia, droughts in Mozambique and the rest of our continent and so on and so on. This particular epoch and the accelerated uh, natural disasters and as well as man-made disasters, it calls for an epistemic rupture that will allow us to reconstitute the political, to reconstitute the geospatial as well as the economic uh, makeup of the world. Mm. So, um, perhaps in closing, I should also refer to uh, Boaventura de Souza Santos, who states that for the longest time, those that have, those that find themselves uh, benefiting from global capitalism and this uh, debt project have actually created this sense of security or experienced this almost full sense of security in the midst of abject poverty and mayhem. And this sense of security gets mixed with feelings of arrogance and even condemnation towards all those who feel victimized by these very social conditions or solutions. So the viral outbreak interrupts the common sense and causes the sense, almost a sense of security to melt overnight. We know that the pandemic is not blind and that it has its preferred targets. With it, however, a common awareness of planetary, democratic-like communion is somehow beginning to be created. So what Santos um, is gesturing towards, basically, is a world of tolerance, the creation of an alternative world, another world where we, as human beings, acknowledge that we are not invincible. If anything, we are fragile. We also have to realize and recognize that the lines that divide us, all the, the tyrannical lines that are highlighted before, uh, do not have a space and cannot necessarily result in um, any, anything good for anyone. If anything, we're dependent on each other as human beings, mm -hmm. irrespective of our color, creed, um, and, and, and preferences. Right. So, so to, to, in closing then, uh, I think this virus, in a twisted way, can actually afford us an, opp an opportunity to unthink some of the things that we know about ourselves mm -hmm. as the Anthropocene, and to rethink some of the ways that we've been engaging with our fellow human beings but also within, with the, within, within natural capital as well, referred in global capitalism as, as, as resources. I think we, we're finding ourselves at a cost where we can um, try and imagine another world, a world that we can, um, that those that are to come can inherit uh, with pride and those that went before us can actually be proud of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric. What an amazing topic. We only have complimentary um, comments here from everybody in the audience that's actually listened to this discussion today. So thank you so much for that. If I can read some of the comments uh, from the public, we have Vuyo, uh, or Vuyi rather, who has actually stated, I love this topic. These ideas make one think critically about what's going on in the virus scape. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric, for the insights. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The second comment that we have for you as well is from Lynn Delwa, and she's actually stated that the topic is extremely interesting and then that you've also provided some major insights this evening. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. No, you've impressed everyone. And then from Samuel, 
he's actually said that global entanglement, he loves this phrase and that this topic should be a continuous one. Thank you so much, Sam. Right, the next uh, comment as well says, Dr. Makwani, how would you, in your capacity as the professional planner, change the moment we live in? How would planners adapt planning in the aftermath of COVID-19? Okay, thank you. Um, should, I, should I go for it or should I um, wait for I, one I think, more? I think we can definitely start kicking off. Okay. Thanks. All right. No, th 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 thank you so much for that for that uh, uh, question, and I I think this becomes a a planetary question because we face with the planetary crisis, um, and this kind of crisis requires a trans, if not a multi slash transdisciplinary uh, approach. So 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 we we cannot afford. Uh, to engage in, 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 in what uh, some scholars refer to as uh, disciplinary decadence, where planners are on one side trying to find solutions to citizen regions, and uh, medical uh, experts like Dr. Kim are actually focusing on the, on, the, on, on, on the biomedical issues and so on and so on, and constructors basically thinking about something else. I think this needs... Um, and all hands on deck kind of approach. And mm. that can only happen if we have uh, what one might term um, a global project of decolonization and the decolonization of the mind. So the spaces that we live in were created and imagined through racial imagining. I mean, if you look at our continent or the global south, we know what colonialism did, what apartheid did, uh, those particular projects of, 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 of marginalization were imagined by someone and they were actually put on paper and action and laws and regulations and planning instruments were actually used to, to realize those segregationist uh, uh, ideas. So I think given that, now we need a color to that, that is uh, global decolonization, that can allow for a transcended um, disciplinary approach to, to the cities and to the regions that we live in. Because as planners, we have a propensity to a tendency of thinking that we can actually solve planning-related problems. But then mm -hmm. cities are for people, and cities are actually inhabited by um, variegated or, or varied um, people with disciplines from different disciplines and, 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 and the knowledge systems that we are yet to tap into. And maybe it's something that I will talk about at a later stage because um, we find ourselves now, it's particularly us in Africa and in the global South, especially in, in, in Africa, we find ourselves waiting for some miraculous jab of our, our vaccine to come from elsewhere. Right? But then we've had our indigenous knowledge systems for centuries, and those knowledge systems have been actually marginalized as a result of the epistemicides uh, that our continent experienced for over 400, 500 years. Mm -hmm. So now, back to planning, back to the cities, uh, and back to, and, 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 and one more point, uh, Kim, before I, 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 I leave this particular uh, question, I just wish to, to highlight specifically to planners that mm -hmm. planning, Planning is a global um, activity. It is a global project. Right? It must be viewed as such. Right? From, the, from the, uh, uh, the Berlin Conference, when our continent was actually bifurcated um, by the colonizers in Berlin, right? right through to the now, that was planning. That was the beginning of planning. But it was obviously devilish planning, isn't it? Because it used racism and the what Ben uh, calls the metaphysics of difference to actually uh, parcel people, spatially 
and divide and rule and so on and so on. And so as planners, we're still grappling with that. We still need to shake off and decolonize ourselves from that kind of planning and probably rethink or unthink this whole idea of zoning and, and actually classifying people um, uh, by their, their races and by their class, their income and so on and so on, because that continues to be stratification. Maybe it's time that as planners, and I'm reading this with uh, David Harvey, we need to try and come up with other ways of thinking about our species. We need to have probably a knowledge common or knowledge commons that can allow for ecologies of ideas to, mm. to, 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 to actually spring up. Thank you so much, Kim. Thanks, Dr. Eric. Anything from you, Dr. Libeko? I know you're having problems with your connection this evening. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eric, for that uh, insightful talk. Um, so, so much. I've been intermittently disconnected, so even my thought process is a bit haywire. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I've got just a few questions or comments. Um, I'll start off with, the, with what you just mentioned now with regards to you know, our longstanding uh, African indigenous knowledge systems. Um, so my question is, uh, you know, looking at um, the vaccine landscape and how vaccines have been accelerated through the, the pandemic, um, do, we, do we feel like um, the IKS or the Indigenous Knowledge Systems has been given, you know, the similar platform uh, for it to be, you know, to be expedited, you know, in inverted commas so that it can be part of the adju adjuvant therapies or anything of that nature? So do we think that the African landscape in terms of, you know, that IKS has been given equal opportunity um, um, in terms of, you know, looking at uh, COVID-19? Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nibirgo, for, for, for the question. And it is a very pertinent question because um, it talks to um, the whole idea or concept of, of knowledge. In other words, mm -hmm what constitutes knowledge and what constitutes valid knowledge. So, mm -hmm. so, so from, I happen to be a member of Aden, which is a decolonial group. And what we've read through the text is that for centuries, um, it is only Western slash Eurocentric slash North American knowledge uh, ideas that have been deemed to be knowledge with the capital K. If anything, that knowledge from the global north has been deemed to be the only knowledge which is almost tantamount to the truth with the capital T and true science with a capital S. Right? So, so if, you, if, 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 you, if, if you're looking at it through those lens, then if you look at the, the genealogy of the globalization or the universalization of knowledges from the, the global north, you realize that we had what some scholars have termed a uh, global epistemicide. So global epistemicide basically was the killing, the suffocation and the marginalization and the pushing away of knowledge systems in the global south and replacing those particular knowledge systems with what is now referred to as Western knowledge. So if you take the, that lens, uh, Dr. Libu, and, and you, you sort of zoom into what's happening currently, especially with regard to indigenous knowledge systems and um, medicines and vaccines, you realize that uh, even to this day, there's still that hangover of the dominance of Eurocentric uh, conceptions of what medicine is. Eurocentric and Western conceptions of what uh, constitutes uh, sophisticated science, um, mm -hmm. Westernized conceptions of uh, what a doctor is, and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can give you a simple example of um, uh, in Guni culture, we call, we call them um, Izangoma, Inyanga, you know, people that actually they are the they are the doctors, the traditional doctors. But in, 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 in Eurocentric, uh, in some Eurocentric texts, 
they're still referred to as witch doctors. And so there's that witch and doctor conundrum, that witch and doctor sort of uh, uh, paradox that is actually put out there. Right? So already from, from naming that creates uh, problems of a universal scale, of a planetary scale. So now what we've seen then in the crisis of, and, and, and recollect that over the last year, we haven't had any form of vaccine emerging. It's only, I think, what, we're into the second or third month where now vaccines are beginning to actually emerge in the market. But then there was a time when the entire world was in the dark with people basically running around like the proverbial headless chickens, not knowing what to do. And in, in, that, in that dark epoch, in that dark moment, uh, uh, Dr. Mareva, what we saw were instances or signs of um, radical thinking about medicine and what constitutes medicine. So in South Africa, for instance, we saw people going back to what it, uh, is known to as uh, in, 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 or in Goni languages, but going back to the traditional herbs. Uh, mm. But we also saw dietitians actually recommending um, some remedies. I think it was in Venezuela where there were some remedies mm. that the government was actually coming up with uh, mm. Mm. to try and deal with, the, with, with, with this particular pandemic. So as I was witnessing that unfold, I just realized the, the detrimental nature of epistemicides, the detrimental nature of the killing or the marginalization or the, the deliberate dwarfing of um, mm -hmm. other knowledge systems. Right? Mm -hmm. Because now, uh, since the Western medicine has actually created this myth around itself to be the only medicine that matters, much has not happened in so far as the development of other medicines is concerned. Mm. And that has created mm. a void and it has created a crisis uh, that now calls for um, some unthinking and rethinking and re-engineering of the whole knowledge spectrum in order to bring back those knowledges that were either to deemed to be uh, dark, you know, dark magic, mm. witchcraft mm. this and the other. Mm -hmm. So, so that's uh, in, 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 so in closing, so far as this question is concerned, I think the idea of indigenous knowledge systems it becomes very important. If anything, even the so-called Western medicine is indigenous to some parts of the world, isn't it? I mean, it started somewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. and it was indigenous yeah. to someone. So, so why is it that uh, um, med medication and medicine that we have some parts of the mm -hmm. world should mm -hmm. be relegated to the indigenous. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's like calling other people indigenous people as if as if those that are actually naming other people indigenous are from elsewhere, right? So I think the naming of the so-called IKS indigenous knowledge system itself needs to be decolonized. We need to start talking about medicine, right? If we're to localize medicine, we can talk about African medicine. We can talk about European medicine, Asian medicine, and so on and so on. But we need not fall um, in the trap of actually uh, being stuck, ha having our systems and knowledge systems stuck in history, right? Mm -hmm. The indigenous yeah. people, the natives, uh, with their indigenous ways of doing, with their cultures, their, 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 their oral history, and their mm -hmm. animals and their leopards and so on. And so, on. so I think yeah. we, the, the whole thing is linked and we, we, we need to start basically disentangling everything as it were. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Eric, for a very comprehensive response. Do you think there's space for integrative medicine? So the use of your vitamins and you know, eating healthy as well as increasing polyphenol content in terms of actually fighting COVID-19. What's your take on that? Yes, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Kim. I, I must say uh, that, as you know, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, you, 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 and um, Dr. Mariva should be in a, in a, in a, in a, I mean, 
uh, best position to, 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 however, I will respond because I also mm -hmm. find myself uh, glorifying uh, lemon water, what water and lemon <laughs> glorifying yeah, yeah. vitamin D, something that I've never actually taken in my life, glorifying vitam vitamin C. Um, now, within my lexicon, our le everyday lexicon, and I, I, I dare say across the entire world, as a result of the anatomical politics that I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. we as people are beginning to integrate in our everyday talking lexicon, these medical jargon, you know, uh, viral lord, uh, vitamin D, uh, mm -hmm. lemon water, uh, and, and all these other things that you talked about. You know? so, so our language is actually expanding, right? As we're beginning to engage with this, mm. with this virus head on. And, um, mm. and, and, and to your question uh, briefly, definitely I'm, I'm for um, an integrated approach to medicine. One friend of mine actually uh, did indicate that in some medical schools, they actually promote integrated uh an integrated approach to medicine i mean mm -hmm. if you look at countries such as cuba you'll correct me if i'm wrong uh, uh doctors but but you'll find that in cuba they they actually celebrate that uh integrated uh approach to medicine and and, mm -hmm. and finally people people in africa and in some parts of the global south have actually been um approaching their health issues uh, from an integrated perspective. I mean, you have um, a person actually consulting a doctor, a so-called Western doctor, but also having isangoma or inyana, you know? Mm -hmm. So you go to your, to, your, to your doctor in the morning, and then in the evening, you go to, to Alexandra there to see your, your isangoma mm -hmm. so that you can you can engage in some divine stuff. And, 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 and I think what makes um, traditional medicine very important is that it has never lost that spiritual side of things. Because mm -hmm. um, in, 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 that, in, 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 in that particular field or sphere, it is celebrated that a human being consists of the body, the soul, and the spirit. So if the spirit is not at ease, if it's diseased, then the body will react in a, in, a, in, a, mm. in a negative kind of way. So there's always been that attempt to, to bring together the spiritual, the physical, or the, the spiritual, the material, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the metaphysical. Thank you so mm. much. Mm. Thank you. Okay, one yeah. other question from me, sorry, Dr. Libeko, is would it be possible to balance the epidemiological prudence of COVID-19 with economic survival. How can we balance that? How can we reposition ourselves? You know, there's this notion that countries that struggle to get the vaccine or that struggle to really overcome the current crisis that we're in will take longer to recover. So how do we, what strategies can we really use to overcome this imbalance? Thank, thank, thank you, uh, Doc, for that. Uh, and, you know, your, your, your question uh, is linked to this whole idea of the economy versus the people. Right? Mm. So we, we live in an, in, in, a, in an epoch where material things are valued, uh, commodities are valued more than people. So if anything, there's the commodification of people. Or where people find themselves actually worshiping things, worshiping the lurings and the trappings that come with, uh, with, 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 with capitalism and global capitalism, the shiny mm. things, the bling culture, cross materialism and hyper consumption. Right? Mm. So much so that, uh, I mean, these things, the, the idea of the economy is intrinsically linked to the bling lifestyle, to the bling culture, to be to floss, to flaunt, and so on, and so on. And, 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 and I think what the, the, this crisis has made us realize is that spaces should be for people. Communities and societies should first prioritize people. 
So now we're going back to the to the basics, if you will. We're going back to um, Ubuntu, right? Mm. Um, to say the people are the ones that actually should take precedence. And life, life in totality, the human life as well as the non-human life. And by non-human life, I'm referring to the natural environment, the plantations, the vegetation, the animals, and all the species mm -hmm. should actually uh, take center stage right, mm. in, in, in this world. And we should have that balance right, between the human and the non-human because now we've seen and we're witnessing it. We're in the, in the eye of this, this storm, basically, where people are basically being chased away by viruses and now we have to wear masks, we cannot breathe, our atmosphere is is polluted, and so on and so on. So ultimately, so, so, so to answer your question directly then, I think it becomes important to prioritize people over economics. If anything, the economics that we faced with, the so-called global economy that we faced with, is primarily a, a capitalist economy. Not so. Mm -hmm. It's a racist economy predicated on uh, the creation, the deliberate creation of uh, a multitude of people that do not have work. Right? The creation of cheap labor that the, 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 the so-called market cannot even afford to absorb. Mm -hmm. right? That is why now, in, I mean, if you look at South Africa, for instance, you've got this so-called phenomenon of jobless growth. It's not, it's not a phenomenon, it's what capitalism does. It creates this cheap labor, or, 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 or what uh, some decolonial scholars refer to as excess labor, mm -hmm. where there's just bare life right, for capitalism to, to play around with, as it were. So to your point, uh, the idea of economics, the idea of economic growth, should actually prioritize people. It should be rethought. It should be reconstituted, um, to use uh, Gajani's words. It should be reformulated completely because clearly this racialized, uh, patriarchal, uh, global capitalism and its economies as well as its technologies of power is not working for multitude of people. I mean, we, we've been controlled by multinationals. It's not a conspiracy theory. We've seen it. I mean, we've been controlled by very few companies right? that can close, that can shut down the internet, that can do whatever they want and so on and so on. So, mm -hmm. and that is linked again to the idea of the worker, right? To say that some people are born to be workers elsewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. So this economy clearly is wrong. So, 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 so in a nutshell, uh, Doc, I think there is no balance in there. If anything, people, as people, we need to go back to the to the to the fundamentals and to, to decolonize what we mean by economic development, to basically find an alternative to global capitalism because it's not working, especially for us that find ourselves in the global south and uh, at the heart of, of, of coloniality. Um, and then we need to prioritize life. So now that talks to your to, to what to refer to as epidemiological uh, discourse. I think that epidemiological discourse has to be informed by saving lives mm. as opposed to, because now, and linked to that again, and I'm, I'm, I'm yet to see how this is going to unfold because mm. now the, 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 the vaccine is, the, vaccine, the vaccines are found and I've realized that some vaccines are more important than others. I've seen on social media that some vaccines are meant to be localized to specific spaces, not for use in, say, specific spaces. Right? So this uh, vaccine nationalism must stop uh, mm. because if people in Togo are not vaccinated because they do not have money, people in Los Angeles will never find peace. Right? Because mm -hmm. this virus does not know any bounds and, or any boundaries or skin color. Thank you so much. Mm. Such, such pertinent points that you've raised there. 
Dr. Liberko, do you have any other questions? Okay. Um, I don't have um, any more questions, but I think just um, on, on the last point that uh, Eric made with regards to um, the, the, the differential distribution of maybe um, not vaccines per se, but maybe drugs. So I think we need to draw the difference between what's there and what, you know, what's out there. So, you know, with regards to certain drugs, because of the regulatory uh, authorities and regulatory bodies, then they can't be sold in specific countries. So that's the reasoning behind why, you know, you've got labels of, you know, this particular drug, but not vaccines. So we must be clear about that. This particular drug cannot be sold maybe in the US or in the UK. It's because okay. of issues no, that you. regard, you know, patenting, distribution, ah. um, you know, distribution restrictions and so on and so forth. So that's, that's another right. arm of, of, of you know, regulation which, which comes into play when it comes to pharmaceuticals, right? But with regards Thank to vaccines, so much, it's going to be about, the, the, the difference would then be about the storage conditions. So if you look at South Africa, for instance, it doesn't have, you know, a cold chain storage. Therefore, particular vaccines will not be viable in a country. So if you look at the vaccine like Moderna, if you look at BioNTech, those vaccines would not be available for us in large quantities because of the storage limitations okay. that we've got. But okay. AstraZeneca can be stored in a normal fridge, therefore it can be sold. That's why 70% of AstraZeneca is gonna be what's disseminated in the South African content, and then 5% Moderna, and then 5% BioNTech. So I think we need to have clarity on those landscapes when it comes to vaccine distribution and drugs with regards to, you know, legislature and, you know, um, and, and such instances. So I think I just wanted to clarify that. Um, Thank you so much, Doc. So, yeah. So just on, 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 on closing remarks, um, I wanted to ask a question, but I think it's going to prolong the whole discussion. Uh, but we can ponder upon that question in our own spaces where, you know, looking at um, the, the, the special uh, inequality of the South African context uh, with regards to settlements and cities, what has been the effect of lockdown on such, you know, on such spaces? You know, has it, has it been effective, uh, you know, to, to certain uh, parts of South Africa and, and so on and so forth? So I'll just leave it, you know, for us to, to ponder upon. But I think in closing, I'll just do a bit of a summary in terms of what Dr. Eric has, has um, you know, said for, uh, today uh, to us. So he spoke um, mainly on the issue of um, law uh, and, and, and you know, the landscape. And, um, you know, he had very interesting terminologies such as the lawscape, which really talks about, you know, the synergy or the, the, the reciprocal uh, the reciprocal nature of the law and the city and how uh, the pandemic has actually changed that landscape to, you know, a phenomenon such as the necroscope or the viroscope where, you know, um, there's a bit of a, a dampening of the human right to prioritize certain legislatures and laws that can govern how we deal with the fear of death and, and so on that the pandemic brings in our, in, our, in our shores. And I think one of the important aspects that you mentioned is the long-standing issue of uh, special segregation or you know, racial um, you know, uh, disparity that you know, exists or that has existed for the longest of time. And, this, and how this has really impacted on how we respond to COVID or how COVID has transcended through the, the globe. So those are the important aspects that you, you, you mentioned. And um, I think, you know, going back to the issue of, of globalization, you know, how uh, uh, you know, increased mobilization of, of, of people, uh, you know, called the clock, the clock trotters and the migrants has actually fueled the dissemination of, 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 um, of disease and, and you know, talking about COVID-19 in, in, in particular and how this, this mobilization or globalization has actually fueled how the virus has spread throughout the globe. And um, I think, you know, lastly, because of such a dramatic and tremendous change in, in mm -hmm. you know, how the world has been for the past, you know, 12 months, 
then we, 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 we left with the whole notion of what I would want to call a global reset, where we reimagining the new world and how the world would look like and doing introspection in terms of, you know, how we, 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 we use our resources and how we treat each other as, as human beings and so on. So I think in as much as the pandemic has, has had very negative effects on, on us globally, it has given us an opportunity to globally reset our mindset in terms of you know, how we approach and how we treat one another uh, across the globe and how we should now um, centralize how we see ourselves as opposed to decentralizing between the white and the black and those those type of you know uh, segregation. So I think with that said, um, you mentioned a very important aspect that you know the virus knows no borders, it knows no race, it knows no wealth, and therefore the world isn't safe until you know an affordable vaccine is available to each and every uh, corner of the world. And I think it's a very important aspect of today's message to say that, you know, we, you know, the, the viral landscape is, is so um, oblivious to who you are, what you have, and uh, mm. we all at risk. So what needs to happen is we must have an affordable um, preventative uh, vaccine. But I think with that said, um, I believe that, you know, preventative vaccines must go hand in hand or given, be given an equal opportunity to indigenous knowledge systems, as well as therapeutic drugs, which would then be able to um, alleviate you know, the severe symptoms of COVID-19. So I think all the three arms must work hand in hand, preventative measures, therapeutic drugs, as well as you know, alternative knowledge systems that might compensate or adju you know, adjuvant therapies that would uh, accelerate us to the healing period you know, past COVID-19. So with that said, thank you very much, Eric, for that uh, thoughtful um, talk. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lamont, for bringing back the seminar series to life in 2021. And we look forward to many more uh, seminars of this nature. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You so much. All, right. All right, then. Good night. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, so hold on, Eric. I just want to read for you the last few comments from the public, and then I'd like to close with a quote. I always close oh, okay. with a quote. Yes. All right. so, so we have Bali Seng here who's said that she completely agrees with Buyo. This is a very important topic that you've addressed. The topic was extremely interesting. It highlighted the various intersectionalities faced by black people in South Africa and around the world because of the virus. So that's the first comment. And then the second comment that we hadn't addressed also came from Samuel. I strongly believe that we really need to start documenting all or what is termed indigenous. I think that it is one of the reasons why it is mainly relegated as inferior. So those are a few closing remarks from the public. Thank you so much, Eric, for this evening. There were so many nuggets of wisdom there, really, that one could look at, looking at terms like global entanglement, looking at the necroscape, the viruscape, looking at the effect that planning could potentially have on waste management, as well as um, how we're actually going to manage the dissemination of the vaccine in itself. So it's really been an extremely insightful talk from you. I think the general public definitely wants to hear more. So we really hope that you'll provide us with a bit more time further down the line with regards to another seminar. And then I'd like to leave us with a quote for this evening. So it's a quote from Martin Luther King. An individual has not started living fully until they rise above the narrow confines of their own individualistic concerns and they rise to the broader constraints of humanity. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Thank you, Dr. Libeko, for facilitating, and thank you, Dr. Eric, for that extraordinary talk. Really insightful. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dr.